Okay, so let's take a look at the transformation tools um, in the modify menu. We've this we've got this very important sub menu here, which contains the move, rotate, and scale tools. Uh, we can't get very far uh, in in 3D applications without kind of relying on these at some point. But something that I'd just like to note is that these three tools here are basically the same that um, occur in the toolbox there, which we can switch between. Notice that what's simply happening is it's switching the gizmo type so that we can switch it to say scale and then we can click on the arms of this one of the axes of the of the gizmo and then we can have it take effect constraining along that axis uh, there's a few other things we can do usually we're probably going to be using the shortcut keys for this if we do any um, any great deal of uh, modeling or anything this is probably what we'll be used to is the shortcut keys w e and r to just get through those um, so let's just give this plenty of time in blender as we jump over here um, just to make sure that we um, cover all the things that we can do with these uh, moving, rotating and scaling objects in the 3D view here. Well, first of all, you'll notice that this gizmo is very similar. Um, we get the, uh, the three pronged or arrows kind of emitting from this selected cube here. Um, basically, we can switch this gizmo on and off or the 3D manipulator as it's termed in uh, Blender uh, just down here in the 3D header. Uh, we can get this exactly the same sort of icon down here. We get this three-pronged icon with the red, the RGB representing the X, Y, Z. Um, what we could do is we can just switch this on and off here, or we could do this with a shortcut key, which is the Control and the Space key, and that's just um, quite simple there. Once it's activated, um, visible in the 3D view, we can we get these three additional icons to the right of it, which is just the arrow for the translate and then the curve here for rotate and this little square at the end of a um, diagonal line just to represent the, the, the look of the scaling, the traditional scaling uh, icons that we get in the 3D view there, the arms of the axes. Um, what we can do um, now is just left click on any of the um, arms there just to constrain it similarly as we would, would in um, Maya. Um, something else to note is that um, we will probably before too long, we're gonna want to be using shortcut keys for these, really. Um, so let's just cover these now. Um, it's not quite the same as you get in many applications. This W E R sort of thing. Um, what we would get instead is the G key for grabbing or moving. That's basically the equivalent there. We've got R for rotating and S for scaling. Now you'll notice what's happening in the three D view is as we actually just um, it's not strictly the same as just switching the gizmo type. What we're, what's actually happening is we're immediately entering into a, um, an active state here. We're actually, wherever we move the mouse now, this is actually taking effect. Uh, so it's worth um, uh, finding out what's, what's going on here. Uh, this is actually really useful, uh, very, very handy indeed, because what we can do is we can combine this. Um, first of all, we can just cancel this if we want with just the right mouse button, and just uh, it takes us out of that if we didn't mean to do that, or we can just hit the, the, the escape key. Um, but uh, if we do, we're just press G now to start moving this around or grabbing it, uh, what we can do now is just constrain an axis. So we can go um, X, and now you can see that we've constrained it along the X axis, or the Y, we just switch that if we want. Um, something else that we can do here now is take this one step further and just start keying in numerical values. So, for example, if we go minus 7, we can see what's happened there is it's taken us it, basically that operation will always show up in the bottom of the toolbox here the last thing that we've just done and we can see we've got negative seven in the y uh, it's constrained along the y there and um, so that's uh, basically a really handy thing that we can do there if we know what we want to do we can also type in numbers into here as well so we could just um, maybe we don't want to do it in that way but um, let's just plus 14 and now it's seven in the other way or maybe we only want it half that distance, we can just divide that by two. Um, so that's all uh, very handy stuff. Um, some of the other things that we can do is um, switch the local and global axis. So for example, if we were to, I'm just gonna rotate this. Um, it's similarly, we can rotate or scale and key in values, by the way. So we can just press R to enter the rotate. Um, currently we're just uh, rotating in, um, uh, sort of in the orientation of the current view um, so around the, uh, the the camera that we're looking through right now but if we were to uh, constrain it along the x-axis we can see we can, can um, just move it there but what, we, what I'd like to do is just key in 45 degrees um, and I've keyed in 405 unfortunately so let's just do that again um, let me just cancel that out first and then just go rotate 
x45, enter, and then we can see that that's um, taken effect there. Um, something else that we can do now is as we G to grab it, I can constrain it along the Z axis. And now what, what I can do is I press Z again, and we can toggle between the local and the global axis, as we saw that that just shifted there. So we've got those three modes, which is just free, and then constraint to global. And then if we hit Z one more time, we've got um, the uh, local Z. Also note that down here, we've got this readout, which is basically telling us exactly what's happening. So if you're unsure as to what mode you're currently in, we can always check this. Also, we can, um, just if I just press Z, um, oh sorry, if I just press G and then uh, Z to constrain it there, we can see we're actually getting a readout as to exactly how much we want to um, to do that. Also, I can hold Control and just do incremental uh, moving, so we can see we're moving uh, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on and so on. In the in the uh, bottom left there, we can see that reading out. Um, so that's just one thing uh, to note there. Um, Something else that we can do is uh, make middle mouse selections. Um, so for example, what we can do is we can press G and now if I just middle mouse, hold down the middle mouse, I can kind of gesture in the, in the, in the direction of these um, axes that we can see here just to select the, the axis for us. Um, so once I've selected that axis there, I can just let go of the middle mouse and now we're constrained and now I can move freely with the mouse. What I can also do is shift select and now uh, shift middle mouse, I mean, and now I can select another axis. Um, so for example, let's say those two, and now I can let go, and now I'm constrained along those two axes. Um, so that's quite handy. Uh, that can be done um, also with just shift selecting one of the gizmos there, uh, one of the arms of the gizmo there, the 3D manipulator, uh, shift left selecting that is, uh, and then we can constrain it. What's happening here is we're constraining it along that single plane there. So let's just make that more obvious. Um, you can see that that's just essentially just moving it around horizontally. Um, so that, that, that's uh, pretty handy. That's very similar to Maya's control and left clicking on one of the one of the arms that we would get in the uh, in the gizmo. Um, something else to note is we've just covered the uh, the incremental um, uh, moving there. If you happen to be that to to have that to work, you have to make sure that we are actually on incremental because all control does is just sh uh, switch temporarily the snapping on. So um, if we're on something else, we will temporarily be snapping to vertices if we have that selected and so on. Uh, so that's something worth noting. Something if we want to be snapping to the grid, you'll notice that that option isn't here. Um, if we want to be able to do that, what we're first going to need to do is snap it to the grid. I suppose we could always round down the information here. So we could type in minus two, two and five here, for example, if we wanted it to be that location of the grid. Well, there's a shortcut key for this, which is just shift S. And now we can just go selection to grid. And now we can see it's rounded everything off there to the closest unit. And um, now if we were to move incrementally, so if I just control and left click, we can see um, also in the information here, we could get the readout in the bottom of the 3D view, but um, you can see we're snapping to the grid now. Uh, so that's quite handy. Something else that we can do is once we've clicked on one of these arms here, we can now shift select and we get this much, much finer control after uh, use the uh, mouse a lot further to be able to get that to, um, to, to the same amount of distance. So that's really, really handy for very fine tuned control. Uh, so if we just want to move it a very tiny distance, uh, that's, that's very handy there. Um, something I'd just like to make a note of in terms of scaling, um, if I was to just press S, I'm just going to move the cursor very, very far away from the actual center of the object now. So if I survive press S now, we'll notice that we get this dotted line. This is kind of similar to this fine tuning because um, we've got a very long line here for which to be able to scale down. Um, and uh, so, so we've basically got ourselves a, a more fine tuned control. We can always hold shift as well to get an even more finer tuned control. We actually even hold control and get a fine tuned, very small incremental movements, as we can see there. Uh, so we can start combining many different of these, uh, these different sort of um, uh, blender control methods together. Um, so something to note about that is basically if you press S very close to the object, we don't get much fine control by default, at least until we hold shift. 
um, when when entering in close to the, if we wanted to scale down in this instance, if we wanted to scale up, we've got a little bit more control because we've got more distance that the mouse can travel to get that, that kind of distance. So I just wanted to point that out because that's not uh, immediately noticeable or obvious. Um, and it, uh, I, it took me a little while to uh, actually figure out that that was what was happening. So um, I just wanted to point that out there. So hopefully that covers um, most of the uh, basic moving, rotating and scaling that we can do there. There's always the um, shift control that we can do on these so we can turn it into a multi gizmo, which is very similar to um, Maya's um, uh, in the transformation tool. See, we've got this move, rotate, school, uh, move, rotate and scale tool there. Um, so we can basically get a, a similar kind of effect. In fact, what we need to do is if we want to rotate, just to hit the blue circle there to get that information. Um, but in Blender, uh, we can mix those up into any order we want, or so maybe just those two. Uh, so this is all very handy, um, very uh, useful stuff. And uh, most of the time we can just operate without the gizmo. Um, so for example, we can just go G and then middle mouse to just constrain along an axis and then move it, say, maybe we want to just shift control up to there. You know, that it, it, it's kind of quite handy. We can just scale that down now, or maybe we want to just um, uh, start to reset and transform, uh, freeze the transforms of, of this kind of movement, which is something we'll come up to next. Something else I'd like to take a quick look at in the transformation tools here is just the uh, proportional modification tool and the soft modification tool. Um, to be honest, I, I actually, um, that's kind of a lie really, because I don't want to look at these tools in particular. Uh, as handy as they are, um, I, I find most artists use the soft selection tool, which um, comes as part of, if we double click the, uh, the move tool icon here, um, and we um, scroll down to this area here, we can see I've got soft select turned on. Um, this soft selection is uh, what I see most people using these days. Um, although those other tools are not to be completely dismissed, they are quite handy. There's uh, handles that come with them that will be created in the um, outliner there that we can then uh, manipulate the objects with further. So there is um, some good control within those. Uh, however, I, I see most people using these and um, this is what we can find a reasonable equivalent for in Blender as well. So let's just switch, the, switch into vertex mode there and just quickly demo the tool here. Um, basically, I've just selected a load of vertices. If, we, if I just press B, um, we can see I've switched on select, soft selection, which gives us this gradient view of uh, yellow being uh, most extreme towards black and then nothing at all to see um, to show zero effect. Uh, we see the original vertices type uh, wireframe colors there. Um, so if I was to just now pull this out, we can see we kind of get um, uh, the, that kind of soft selection happening there. So I assume you're all familiar with that kind of idea. There was a lot of fall-offs um, types within here that we can see as well. So we can switch diff to different fall-offs, curve presets as, it's a, as it calls it there. If we just switch into Blender now, we can see I've got another sphere um, created here with just a few of these vertices selected. Now if I press G to just move, we can see what happens without the soft selection on. Um, now basically, if we come down here to the 3D Views header, we can see this little circular icon here. This is proportional editing mode. Um, so that's basically the terminology there for the soft selection. So if I just um, uh, press, th just enable it there with um, the uh, the middle icon there, just press, uh, we can see the fall off to the right. And so we can choose different fall offs there. Um, now, if I press G now, uh, we can see we get this actual circle, um, which is dictating the actual radius of influence there. Um, now, if I, what I'm doing is um, scrolling the mouse wheel to be able to raise that smaller and, and um, uh, larger, and we can see the, the effect taken there. So that's basically just the, uh, the, the a, a brief um, demo of the uh, proportional editing. We can actually toggle that on and off with the O key, as you can see as I press O, the option down there is, is toggling on and off. Um, so that's something to uh, also be aware of. We can just um, now start to manipulate that in a little bit like that perhaps. And then we can see um, we've soft selected or proportionally edited our uh, object. Uh, so that's basically the a quick equivalent demonstration of uh, that particular tool in Blender. Reset transformations and freeze transformations are very similar to each other, so we'll just deal with both of these together now. Uh, the reset transformations, what this will do is um, take this sphere that we have uh, slightly rotated and slightly scaled, as we can see the information there in the channel box, 
Um, basically what it'll do is just be exactly the same as if we were to just key in zero for these details and then one for the scale. Basically the default settings for an object when it's created within Maya. So if we just undo that, the difference between reset and freeze transformations will be that um, it will essentially do the same thing in the channel box here, but it will maintain the rotation and the scaling and any of the location information that we've done there. So if we just freeze those transformations now, you can see that takes effect. So let's just take a look in Blender and just see what the equivalents for this are. Um, we can see we've got this slightly rotated cube here, um, slightly scaled. In fact, we can see the information there in this property sidebar, which we can toggle on and off with the N key. We can also get that much of the same information here in the object um, uh, section of the properties window. Um, but we can just look here at the moment. So I'm just going to give this a bit more space. Um, basically, the equivalent of the reset is simply this clear. So we can go location, rotation, and scale. We see the various different shortcut keys that we've got for this as well. The G, R, and S, the typical shortcut keys for those equivalents if we wanted to move the object uh, or rotate or scale it. And then, um, so if we just go Alt G, we can see the location information is now zero. Alt R, same for the rotation, and Alt S, same for the scale. Um, it's now uh, reset to its default. Um, note the dimensions aren't changing at all on this. It's just... Um, uh, the dimensions will always just respect um, the, 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 essentially the dimensions in space. We can't necessarily play with that just by resetting these. Um, so uh, if we actually now want to freeze the transformations, what we can do is go Control A. Um, it's basically just next to the clear. So we've got um, the apply, location, rotation, and scale. We can see this sh uh, Control A shortcut key there, control A, uh, so we can clear the location and then we can see that's zero. We can clear the rotation and scale and we can see these are now uh, zero and they're back to the defaults. Also note that you've probably um, not failed to notice the fact that this gizmo is the um, now showing that it's at the zero, the center of the world rather than maintaining it where the object was, which is what we got in Maya. Um, so something to be, bear in mind is that if I actually just left click to move the 3D cursor over there and now put the origin with the, um, in fact we can just do this, just transform the origin to the 3D cursor because it's moved over there but we we'll also note that the location has moved. So the location information is basically just where the pivot point is. So if I was to just undo that a few times until the location moves to there, if we, want to, if we wanted to um, essentially do a freeze transform but still maintain the pivot where it is, um, I'd recommend just using the control A and then rotation and scale here. So that will um, zero, uh, create the rotation and scale information back to its default settings but the location uh, won't be changed. Um, essentially, if I use Shift C to um, move the uh, 3D cursor back to the center of the world, there. If we actually did want the gizmo to um, be able to um, flip to the, if we actually did desire that information, uh, I suppose what we could do is just um, change the actual um, pivot point to the 3D cursor that way. So we still have this orange dot representing the um, location there, but we also have uh, the ability to be able to quickly switch it to the origin if, if that's what we wanted. Um, but otherwise, um, it's not really going to be possible to, I'm just going to switch that back. Um, it's not really going to be possible to have a pivot point somewhere, but have the location information actually represent that as zero. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind when looking at resetting and freezing and their equivalents in Blender. This area of the modifier menu is all to do with aligning. Uh, we've got this uh, snap align objects uh, sub menu here with a few different options we've got the align tool and we've got the snap together tool this snap together tool is particularly handy i find myself using this quite a lot um it really gets me out of certain pickles now and again um if i just grab this object here and enter the tool basically we can just select that face we get this arrow emitting from it now and we can click on the face we want to snap to and then we get this dashed line and this nice little um, graphical interface there to show us what's going to happen. Now press enter and we can see we've basically snapped one cube to another. If we wanted to just keep on going and align it further, again, you could just maybe grab that face and maybe align it to that one and then enter again. And then we can see we're essentially just aligning everything there is to 
be aligned within that cube. So um, that's that's particularly useful, especially when um, these transforms happen to be frozen. So um, that's uh, something to bear in mind there. There's, there's no direct equivalent for this tool in Blender. Uh, I have seen an add-on though, um, uh, which is why I mention it really. It's just, uh, this is such a useful feature that I've, I've relied on so many times. I just thought I'd uh, quickly point it out. Um, doesn't come, this add-on doesn't come in by default for Blender. Um, I was gonna see if I can't try and track it down. It may still be in development. So um, I don't necessarily want to uh, try and give it too much attention just now, but um, there are people trying to essentially duplicate this kind of tool here. Uh, it's just worth noting. I, as I say, I'll try and put some information near this video. But let's just take a look at uh, the other aligning within Blender. If I just jump into Blender now, you can see we've got these three cubes uh, on different planes, on different axes. Um, basically, all we need to do is just come down to the object menu within the 3D views header, and then just come to this transform submenu and then we can see we've got this align to transform orientation, but we've also got these align objects. This is what we want in this case. Uh, this gives us the most options. So just click on that. You can see everything aligned. By default, I don't believe that'll happen. Uh, by default, it'll probably look a bit more like that. Nothing will happen. But if we hit F6, um, we can see all the information in there and we can just select what we want to align against. Of course, if you've got the tool shelf open like we've got here, we could also just do the same thing there. Um, that's just the same information as the F6. Um, so we can just uh, align it along those there if we wanted to, or on all three axes we can see we're aligning. Um, and uh, so that's basically the, the, the simple way of being able to do that. Uh, the other option for aligning that we can do, which is quite handy, is um, to simply uh, just go to transform and then align to transform orientation. And we can see that's essentially switched the rotation of this um, to the rotation of the, uh, the, the world. Um, so if, in fact, we didn't need to necessarily select that second object there. So if we just make this point a bit clearer and um, just go object transform and then align to transform orientation. We can see that's flipped around there. Now, when this com becomes useful for selecting multiple objects is because if I just actually just take this um, object here as the active object, just make sure it's the last one selected with the lighter orange uh, outline to it. We can switch this to local and now we get the, uh, the local transformation there. Now, if I was to run the tool, uh, this object will take on the rotation of this gizmo, which is essentially the um, axes of this rotated cube here. So if I just try that, uh, we can see now that's basically got the same rotations. So 22 minus 7, 26. Uh, 22 minus 7, 26, 22, and so on and so on. So it's basically just copied the uh, rotation information across. Uh, there's probably other ways to be able to do that as well, like the copy attributes and things, but um, we'll just get into that uh, uh, as and when. But um, uh, those are some of the basic ways that we might do some aligning within Blender. The Make Live option here, uh, what this will allow us to do is take a uh, surface such as this one, um, it's quite applicable for this kind of scenario. If we want to try and snap objects to the surface or be able to move things around, um, this is what we can use this for. Um, essentially, if we just select the object and then go Make Live, you see we get this faded green outline now, uh, this wireframe to it. And now what we can do is possibly best uh, if we just create a using a bezier curve for example although we can do this with any objects really um, it will snap to the surface so if we just start to try and click some points we can see maybe if i go into the uh, the depths of this terrain here now and then go to the peak again a little bit more and then back to this kind of area uh, we can see maybe that that's conforming to the surface more or less um, obviously the bezier handles are, are making it not completely conform uh, everywhere but you get the idea i guess um, and then uh, otherwise then at this although we can't see it there i just need to reopen the uh, menu but what we can do is if we just pull that over there we see now the options now make not live um, which seems like unusual english to me it seems like a um, a kind of a linguistic gymnastic move to try and just avoid having something which is unpleasant in the menu like kill or make dead or something like this i don't know it's just it's my problem obviously i'll i'll have to deal with it um uh it's probably just me uh but anyway if we just grab that object and say make not live or at least we don't need to um select it we just go make not live and then we can see that turns it off and then we can just try and 
oh, refresh that menu now, give it a little tickle. And we can see uh, we get the make life option back again, so we can select what we need. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, for some reason I just feel like maybe it's meant to say activate or make inactive or something like that. Anyway, it's 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 my problem. I'll deal with it. Um, uh, let's just jump over to Blender now and just take a look at some of the uh, the translation here, the the, um, the essential equivalent. Uh, so here we got another undulating type plane surface here, same sort of idea, kind of soft selection or the uh, proportional editing tool as we've got in uh, Blender here. Um, all we need to do for this is just switch on the snapping, change the snapping type to face. And then we've basically got the same idea now. Um, if I actually just go to create a Bezier curve, um, we can see the Bezier curve always gets um, selected at the point of the, uh, the 3D cursor there. So it's just over there at the moment. If we just move that into position, um, what we can do now is um, just start to move it and we can see it's actually conforming to the surface there. Um, if we just want to do that a little bit more specifically with the um, the actual points of this curve, what I can do is um, I'm just going to tab and then just make sure everything's selected with the A key and then uh, I'm just going to press V to get a uh, select the handle types automatic. Um, I find that this is the easiest way to uh, begin creating curves with the uh, Bezier handles anyway until we really get stuck into this at a later date. I'm just going to press G with everything selected just so that it uh, conforms everything to the surface and then um, I'm just going to go and now select that point and now just press E to, to extrude the points and now just press select to um, confirm that and then just repeat that move again so I'm just pressing E to extrude and then left select uh, to just confirm that point so E to extrude and then left click E and then left click E then left click and then we can see that's kind of having the same kind of idea there um, again, this is possible with any objects or any, any type of geometry. Um, so that's essentially the make live equivalent within Blender. The center pivot is uh, quite straightforward. Um, it's actually really ha easy to uh, manipulate the pivot point of an object in Maya. Uh, we can just hold down the D key and then um, continue to hold down the D key while we press X, C or V to highlight uh, the grid the curve or the vertices. As you can see, I'm actually just holding down there and just toggling through those options. Um, and once we do that, once I hold down V now with the D key, I can just middle mouse gesture and just move this wherever, wherever we like. And then uh, we can also hold down C to just um, put it down to an edge, as you can see there, maybe somewhere along this edge is where we want to put this pivot point. Um, and then we just let go and it's there. So it's really, really straightforward to do. And if we want to center the pivot, we can just hit center pivot and it's back to uh, the center of the geometry, basically. So uh, let's just take a look at some of the ways that we would do these kinds of moves in Blender. Um, here we've got this undulating surface again. Um, it's actually unfortunately not very easy or intuitive to be able to move the pivot around. We need this 3D cursor as a kind of a middleman. Um, so uh, let's just do a very simple case at the moment. We can see this orange dot in the center of the, uh, the mesh here. Uh, that is the pivot point. Uh, the pivot point is essentially the same as the location information. So if we just um, put all those to zero, uh, we can see uh, it's essentially just placed everything. The, that, that dot is now at zero, basically. Um, also, that's just the same as essentially just going Alt-G, which is just resetting the location there. Anyway, if we just move on and just take a look at these pivot points, um, if I tab into edit mode and uh, let's select this vertex in the corner, now what we would need to do is go shift S to, and go cursor to selected. And now the 3D cursor is there at that point. Tab back into object mode. And now what we need to do is go control shift alt and C, which is really uh, is a really strange collection of uh, shortcut keys for me because I do that with my left hand and it's kind of like a lobster claw now. Um, but anyway, if, if we just get these few options now, uh, the origin to the 3D cursor would be the most uh, sensible to try and duplicate, move move it to there, that selected vertex. Um, but of course, we've got these other options, which is just moving the origin to the geometry, which is essentially center pivot. That's the equivalent there. Uh, or we could, um, if I just undo that, we can also just move the geometry to the origin instead. Uh, which would do that kind of move. Um, so essentially it does center the pivot again, but instead it will keep the origin where it was. Um, so that's kind of um, an unusual way of working really, but that's essentially the method. Uh, we just employ this 3D cursor. Um, I think part of the reason why that might be the case is because um, 
we can actually use this 3D cursor as a pivot point. So we can just switch the pivot point to 3D cursor now. So we can maintain the pivot point where it is and we just switch the location. Of course, if we wanted the pivot point to be, say, at this corner now, um, what we could do, we still need to obviously go Shift S and then cursor to selected. But now, so long as we're in um, uh, the orientation, the pivot point, sorry, of the 3D cursor, uh, you know, that's maybe a faster move. So cursor to selected. And now we can see that the, the pivot point is immediately moving with it as well. Uh, so that's perhaps the intended way that workflow with the uh, switch and pivot around quite quickly. And also it means that we do preserve an object's uh, its own separate pivot point, if you like, which we can then just switch to at any time. So the active element in this case, because we're in this object mode. Um, so yeah, basically that's the, uh, the, t the typical way in which we would duplicate some of those moves within Blender. The convert menu here allows us to convert from uh, one type to another. So for example, we've got object types here at the top, nerves to polygons. We've got um, a smooth mesh preview to polygons that we could uh, select there. We've got um, a selection of polygon edges that we can convert to a curve if we wanted, which is particularly useful. And then we've got instance to object at the bottom there and obviously a whole host of other different conditions to another. Uh, so if we just take a look at this in Blender, I've just got these two objects here. I've got a, a mesh object, which you can see is this triangle icon here in the outliner, also in the properties window there, we can see that same icon. And I've got a curve object, which we get this curved line here. Uh, same again in the properties window, so we'll watch out for that. First of all, we'll just look at this um, uh, curve here. I'm just going to switch this fill to a full um, there and then uh, that'll take an effect because we need to bevel it there give it some bevel uh, depth um, and uh, just increase the resolution so we can see we get some kind of uh, cable type uh, or a pipe or something i'm just going to tab into edit mode so we can see that we uh, we have indeed got a kind of a typical curve type mesh um, uh, now what I'm going to need to do is I'm just going to tab out into object mode, press Alt C to bring up the convert menu and then I'm going to go mesh from curve and then we can see now if I tab into object mode we can see it's now um, a mesh and in fact we can see it's actually converted into this triangle icon there as well. Um, so that's the, um, the that uh, particular conversion operation going from a curve to a mesh. Uh, if I take this um, just standard polygon plane uh, and go from a mesh uh, selection of edges to a curve, for example, um, what we can do is I can um, grab these two middle edges, for example. I'm just going to separate them first, so I'm just going to press P and then separate by selection. And now I'm just going to tab into object mode again. I'm just going to hide this plane now. Uh, so just turn off the visibility or press H. And we can see we've got this other um, a polygon plane that now is duplicated, but it's not really a plane, it's just the those two edges. This is something that we can do in um, Blender quite easily. It's not um, dependent on having faces as such. We can just take vertices in space or edges and not have them connected to anything. So we've just got these two edges on their own there. Um, in fact, if we have a look, we can see just two edges of two edges, zero faces in the info window header at the top there, uh, and the three verts, of course. So if we want to convert this, again, just as long as we're in object mode, we can go, um, which I need to switch this to object mode there, just with the tab key. We can go Alt C and then go mesh, uh, sorry, curve from mesh. And now we can see it's switched into a curve icon type there that we can see in various different places. In fact, we can now switch this to full and give it some bevel depth again. And then we can increase the resolution and we again get that kind of pipe looking thing. Um, I thought we can actually switch this to smooth as well, just to get that nice shading. And um, if we were to, what we will need to do, if I tab into edit mode again, it, it kind of behaves very similar to uh, a polygon um, object until we actually set what we type of curve we want this to be, which we can just see the set spline type here. So just um, we're going to set spline type to a Bezier curve. We can see we now get the Bezier handles there. Um, but also one last thing we should do is just to press A to select everything and press V to set the handle types. And I'm just going to set them to um, an aligned type. And then we can see if I now go to select one of the points along the curve, um, we get a typical kind of behavior as you might expect with a curve now. Uh, and then of course we can tab back into object mode and then press Alt C 
bring up the convert menu again and then uh, go mesh from curve and now it's a um, if I just grab a face for example we can see it's uh, now a mesh object in fact we can see it because of the triangle icon as well uh, so that's some basic ways of being able to convert in uh, blender replace objects just allows us to um, select some objects there and just replace them with the last selected object so let's just replace these spheres with this cube and then just click replace objects and we can see that's what's happened if I just click on this option box here we can see we, we've created them as copies rather than instances but we could switch this here if we wanted let's just take a look in blender at how we might do some um, uh, replacing of objects in here first of all we've got these three objects we've got this plane we've got a cone and an icosphere we can see these in the outliner here in fact I've just um, clicked on a little plus icons next to each object just to display the mesh data underneath here we can see it's called cone in fact they're all called the same name as the object at the moment but we could change these this wouldn't be a problem we could just change that to plain sailing for example um, so that's not an issue um, but we can see that here in the properties window under the uh, mesh data, uh, the object data uh, tab of it, we can click this pull down menu here and we can see we've got an, a load of options to choose from. Um, these are all the mesh data within uh, that have been created during this session of Blender basically since the last time it was opened. Um, we can see there's all these different, uh, in fact there's a lot of zeros here you'll notice, that means nothing is using that, that ob there's no object in the scene which is using that data. But we can see how plain sailing here is currently being used, we could switch that to mesh and um, we can see that that's basically replaced it. Um, let's just replace it with one of these so we can see that this is uh, the cone. So let's just replace that plane with the cone. So let's search for it in here. We could also just use the filter at the bottom here. We should just type that in if it got really long. But we can see there's the cone there. So we could, we've just essentially replaced this object with that one. Um, there's no real way in which to be able to do multiple versions. Um, so for example, in the way that we selected multiple objects like the spheres in Maya and then replaced them with the cube. Um, there's no real way I, I'm aware of of being able to do that. So for example, um, as we kind of take these two and then have a look at this icosphere, if we were to now change this to the, the cube, uh, you can see just the last, it's basically this is just affecting the active object, which is, would be this cube here with the last selected object that we had, um, or the icosphere as it was before we've just switched it. Um, there is a way around that, I'll just take a look at that in just a moment though. Uh, in the meantime, just take a look at the fact that this says number two here on both of these now, whereas before when it was, um, when this was plain sailing, um, we can see that that cone there, the number two has vanished, uh, might not take, uh, might, might be fairly obvious um, that that is referring to the fact that there were two objects in the scene um, which were assigned to that mesh data. In fact, let's, let's just switch them back again. Uh, see this cone here, we can see it's totally an, a, uh, an instance as well. So we can see that there are two objects basically using that mesh data. Uh, if we wanted to make this a unique copy, um, we can press the U shortcut key just to bring up this make single user. We can just click on make uh, object and data there and we can see now the number two is gone and it's given it this incremental um, file name there to the mesh data. So if I just undo that there, um, you can see the number two comes back. We can just click on the number two as well. Uh, that would do exactly the same thing. Um, so we can see that that's a possibility there. Also notice that there's this F there. Um, what this will do is if there's anything here with a zero next to it, that means we'll lose it if we open Blender for another session or close it and open it, should I say, uh, unless we've clicked F next to it and then come back to um, whatever else we might like. Uh, we can see now there's a couple of things in there with F, but the one that we've just done, um, we can see that they'll be saved the next time we open up so they won't be lost uh, like the other ones will be. Um, so basically that's just the, the, the simple way of doing some replacing in Blender. As I say, there's no real way of being able to uh, do multiple objects by default like we did with the spheres. Uh, however, we can kind of do this with just a single line of code. Um, I don't want to go too much into this just at the moment because this might start um, length, lengthening this uh, video uncomfortably but um, if we just pull this right out we can see I've just typed out this line of code here um, this is just importing in the Blender Python module um, I'm no coder 
uh, by any stretch of the imagination, by the way, but um, this is just some simple stuff. Um, so we can just import the Blender Python module there um, and then just, uh, just do a quick loop of all the objects that we have selected. So let's just select all those three objects. And then essentially what's going to happen here, it's going to um, take a, a, a sort of uh, the selected objects and replace the data with the active objects data and uh, if we just run the script I'm just going to middle mouse click along the header bar there just to slide it over so we can see the run script button and then just run that there we can see they've all turned into icospheres now uh, because that's the active object in this instance um, if we just tab into edit mode you'll notice that it's that they're all obviously um, going to be uh, instances of one another so they're just you sharing exactly the same object data but well, it's simple to move from here into a, just a straight copy because we could just press the U shortcut key and as we discussed before and then just click object and data and now they'll be all uh, individual in fact we can see on over here it'll give them um, further incremental names just to distinguish them from one another so yeah, that's the basic way in which we can do some replacing uh, within Blender